Hello everyone and welcome to the explanation of the Aeneid Book 1. In today's video I'm going to summarize the first book of Virgil's epic poem the Aeneid and I'm going to explain what's happening and why. To the right you will see a painting of Aeneas on the top and then on the bottom you will see a Greek bireme ship. Bireme means there are two layers of oars and this would have been the type of ship that Aeneas likely would have been sailing around the ocean on his journey. Now, book one has several key players, so I'm going to go over the main names that you should be able to recognize when we're going through the summary of the Aeneid. First, notably, we have the title character, Aeneas. Aeneas was a Trojan prince, the son of Venus, also known as Aphrodite, and Anchises, a mortal man. He's best, his best-known trait is his devotion to the gods. In Latin, this is called pietas. It's similar to piety, but stronger than that. So after the destruction of Troy, it is his destiny to found the city of Rome. So Aeneas is basically tasked with carrying on the Trojan race after Troy has fallen and bringing the surviving Trojans and his family all the way to Italy to found the Trojan city anew in the form of Rome. Now, Aeneas is a demigod. If you've seen Percy Jackson, it's kind of like that. Kind of like Percy Jackson is the son of Poseidon and a mortal woman. Aeneas is the son of Venus, the goddess of love, and Anchises, a mortal man. So that means he has exceptional beauty in the form of a man, so he's very handsome. He's a great warrior, and he's just an exceptional person overall of extremely noble birth due to his godly descent and his royal Trojan descent. Now, the next character we need to discuss is Juno. You might notice Juno as Hera. That's her Greek equivalent. She's the goddess of marriage and childbearing. And she's the wife of Jupiter, which makes her the queen of the gods. So she has a deep hatred for the Trojans, so she does everything in her power to keep Aeneas from his destiny in Italy. She doesn't want the Trojan race to be born anew. She doesn't want Rome to rise and eventually come back and destroy Carthage, a city that is so beloved to her. She has multiple reasons for hating the Trojans and hating Aeneas, and she is just not about Aeneas getting to Italy. She is all about stopping him from his destiny. Now next we have Dido. Dido is the capable and beautiful queen of Carthage, a city in North Africa where Aeneas ends up on his journey. She has a tragic backstory, and like Aeneas, she's an exile who has chosen to found a new city in a new land. And lastly, we have Ascanius. Ascanius is the son of Aeneas. He was born to Aeneas by his first wife, Creusa, who died at the Siege of Troy. So if you don't know about the Iliad or the Odyssey or basically just what happened in Troy, I will briefly go over the Trojan War. And I, when I say briefly, I mean very briefly. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on in the Trojan War and I can't go over all of it quickly. So basically the Trojan War was a huge siege that happened at Troy after a prince of Troy, Paris, stole away Helen the most beautiful woman in the world, who was another man's wife, and that man was a Greek king named Menelaus. So after Paris stole away another man's wife and brought her back to his home city, Menelaus gathered up all of the kings in Greece, including his brother Agamemnon, the most powerful king, and all of those Greek city-states sent their warriors and their bravest men, their kings, over to Troy to capture the city and take back Helen and just destroy Troy. So Aeneas was a Trojan. So that means in this great big siege that happened, Aeneas was on the losing side. So his city was completely destroyed. His friends, his family were all harmed. His wife died, as I mentioned down here, Creusa. She died at Troy. So Aeneas is just devastated. His city is completely gone. Almost everyone he knew from back home is gone, except for the followers who came with him and escaped as well. So he's just trying to start anew after all of that wreckage. 
Now, the introduction of the Aeneid, so we're getting into the summary now. It begins with, Arma viramque cano, I sing of arms and a man. So Virgil begins his poem by giving a preview of what the story will be about, war and a man. The first six books will de detail the journey of Aeneas, the man, and the last six books will detail the war Aeneas must fight in Italy. The war, of course. Virgil will also gives credit to the two epics that predate his work, the Iliad, which was all about the Trojan War, and the Odyssey, which was all about the man Odysseus. Virgil then invokes a muse in order to explore the reasons for the wrath of Juno. Remember we discussed that Juno hates the Trojans, she just really does not want them to reach Italy and start anew. So Juno's hatred for Aeneas and the Trojans is the reason for their difficult journey and their many misfortunes, because they travel all around the sea for a long, long time. They get into storms, they get shipwrecked, they land on terrible places, and they have all these misfortunes. And now, just when the Trojans are about to reach their destination, Juno has a new trick up her sleeve. The Storm Juno goes to Aeolus, god of the winds, and compels him, and kind of bribes him, to create a massive storm that will scatter the Trojan ships and prevent them from reaching Italy. So the storm comes, and it's terrible. The winds are raging, ships are being tossed into rocks, tossed into one another, thrown up into the sky, thrown under the waves. But before it can completely destroy the Trojans, Neptune, the god of the sea, calms the storm and sends the winds away. He's very angry that the storm was created without his permission, that the winds are just going crazy. So he calms it all down, and Aeneas and his followers, they're scattered, but they head back on to the closest land to regroup. So they end up on the shores of Libya in North Africa, not Italy. So Aeneas and some of his companions regroup on the beach, and they wonder whether their other companions have survived the storm or not. Because there's only a small group of them together, and the rest of the men, they don't know where they are. So they're kind of wondering, they're hoping they haven't died, hoping and praying that everything's okay. And now, the story takes a brief turn to a different setting. So we have, meanwhile, on Mount Olympus, Venus goes to Jupiter, and she questions why the Trojans are kept from Italy. She complains about the fate of her son washed up on the Libyan shore, when he's supposed to be off founding Rome. Jupiter reassures her that the fate of Aeneas is unchanged. He will still reach Italy and found Rome victoriously. And Jupiter gives a really detailed prophecy about the future of Aeneas and Ascanius and Rome, which I found pretty interesting. So back on the shores of Libya, Aeneas goes exploring. Aeneas and his faithful companion, Achates, decide to explore the area and find out where exactly they've landed, because they don't know where they are. They don't know if they're in North Africa or Italy or where. So while they're wandering through the forest, Aeneas catches sight of Venus, his mother, disguised as a beautiful huntress. He does not recognize his mother, and he asks her for information on their whereabouts. Venus tells Aeneas that he has reached Carthage, the city of Queen Dido. He also reveals Dido's backstory to Aeneas. Sorry, that should be she. She also reveals Dido's backstory to Aeneas. Then Venus reveals herself and cloaks Aeneas and Achates in a magical cloud of invisibility before she quickly departs. She barely says another word to Aeneas, she just leaves. So now Aeneas knows about Dido's backstory which is very tragic, and I only want to go into it briefly because I want to talk more about what happens in this book and not the backstory of Dido. Basically, Dido was living in the city of Tyre in Phoenicia, and her brother, Pygmalion, killed Dido's husband. Dido was very much in love with her husband named Sychaeus, and Pygmalion murders him. Then Sychaeus comes to Dido in a vision and tells her, flee, I've been murdered by your brother, Pygmalion, don't trust him, don't stay here, take your followers and flee and start anew somewhere else. So Dido, similar to Aeneas, flees her home country, her home city, with followers, 
and establishes a new city, being Carthage. Then Venus, um, or did I already say this? Yes, in a magical cloud of invisibility before she quickly departs. So Aeneas and Achates are now in sort of a cloak of invisibility, kind of like Harry Potter, so they can wander through the city and try and find Queen Dido without being hindered by people with their questions. So Aeneas explores Carthage and awaits Queen Dido. Aeneas and Achates marvel at the new city of Carthage and the hard work of its founders. They seek the temple of Juno in the center of the city and wait for the arrival of the queen. Dido arrives in all her beauty. Her presence is impressive and demands respect and attention. Then, oh my, Aeneas' companions, who were thought lost in the storm, arrive? So Aeneas is thrilled to see them alive, but he now fears that what the queen will receive them. How she'll receive them? What's she going to say? Is she going to receive them hospitably? Is she going to be upset about these foreigners coming into the, her land? Is she going to trust them or distrust, mistrust them? So let's see. So Dido welcomes the Trojans. Thank goodness. A Trojan leader, Ilioneus, tells Dido of their situation and asks for her help. Dido receives them hospitably and promises to send out search parties for Aeneas. It is then that Aeneas reveals himself from the cloud and introduces himself to Dido. He eagerly thanks her for her hospitality and he rejoins his companions happily. Dido is intrigued by Aeneas and she invites him to her palace for a royal banquet. Ooh. So Venus then decides to interfere with Dido and Aeneas. Venus greatly fears the wrath of Juno while the Trojans rest at Carthage. In order to further protect Aeneas, she asks her son, Cupid, to disguise himself as Ascanius, Aeneas' son, and make Dido fall in love with Aeneas. So as the feast begins to calm down, Dido asks Aeneas to tell her all about the Trojan Wars and his travels thereafter. So as you can see, I have a little image of Cupid here. Remember, Cupid is also a god of love, similar to Venus, and he's able to make um, people fall in love with each other. So he disguises himself as Ascanius and goes to Dido with gifts and kind words and makes her fall in love with Aeneas. And Venus thinks this will help better protect Aeneas during his stay at Carthage having her favor and now her passionate love. And now we end book one with Dido requesting that Aeneas tell his story, and he will do so.